Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship this morning at Second Baptist Church. Uh, we are honored that you have taken some time out of your weekend to join us for worship today. Gosh, I hope that you've all survived. Um, I'm not certain if you can see this image on the screen, but I'm wondering if we picked that thinking about what was going to happen yesterday. It kind of makes me think about when I stepped outside my house, whoo, and the whole world was swirling around me. Uh, I hope that your backyard chairs have survived and your trampolines have um, found its way back to your yard and uh, everybody's eyes are rested today after the whirlwind that blew through Lubbock yesterday. Uh, we are um, glad that you guys are with us. I want to say thank you so much um, to you all. If you haven't checked out the email that Darcy sends out each week with the second helping, I invite you to open that email and look at the picture of Rue Ann Reist with all of these dishes that you guys donated with your points uh, from the grocery store. How easy was that to grocery shop and win points and win these free dishes and y'all have supplied an entire kitchen worth of dishes for four families, and that is beautiful. And I just want to say thank you for um, taking the time to bring those dishes by the church and to use your money uh, to help somebody else. That's beautiful. And lastly, I would like to remind you uh, that February the 10th, uh, we have a very important business meeting at 545. I, I invite you to tune in for that. It, it's a Zoom meeting, and you can find the link also in that email that comes out from Darcy each week. Uh, and it, it'll be a great update from what's going on with the VLT um, to things going on in the church and the update for the Covenant of Community too. So tune in for that meeting here in just a, a little over a week. Now, I hope that you have your coffee and you're comfortable and you're ready to sing because I got a preview of what's to come in worship today and they're some of my very favorite songs. So I invite y'all to join in with us as we worship today. Let's take a moment and prepare our hearts and minds for church. The Lord be with you. God's holy ways are just and true. His promises are ever new. Oh, praise him. Alleluia. Bring back to mind God's grace and love, our needs provided from above. Oh, praise him. Alleluia. Tell once again his deeds of old, the story of our mighty God. Oh, praise him. Alleluia. For all his glorious works and ways. We shall rejoice through endless days. Oh, praise him. Alleluia. Let every heart with praises sing and make this house with voices ring. Oh, oh praise, praise him. him. Oh, oh, praise, praise him. him. Alleluia. Alleluia.
Dear God, there are not words to describe your glory and your goodness. You know just how great that you are. We don't praise you to tell you that you are good. You know that. We praise you to remind us of how great that you are. You are faithful to us. Your love is more than we have ever deserved. We praise you for who you are and for the works of your Son. It is in your Son's holy and precious name that we pray. Amen. I invite you to join me for children's time. I'm excited to get to talk to you all this weekend. I hope that you've had a great week and uh, are looking towards this new week to come. I want to tell you a story. Uh, Several years ago, I took, my husband and I, we took our kids on a vacation to Seattle, uh, Washington, and we wanted to go and tour this, the needle that's in uh, Washington there, and it's a really cool thing, and you have to wait in line, and so I took this picture of the boys looking up at the needle, and um, the funny part about the story is our youngest one who's there in the middle, Mason, he's little there, uh, he was really hungry um, this day, and you know, we didn't have time to stop and get lunch because we wanted to get in line to see the needle. So we go and we buy our tickets and Mason is growing um, hangrier and hangrier. You guys know that term because I've heard some of you when you guys have been hungry. It's a, it's a twist between hungry and angry. And when you're this hungry, there is no reasoning with you, uh, boys and girls. And this was the, this was the case with Mason. Well, in my purse um, that day, I had a little package of Altoids. And I got out the Altoids and I said, okay, Mason, if you can just wait through this line and take one Altoid for every Altoid you eat, it will give you one hour of not being hungry. Now, boys and girls, I know that that was not the truth, but at the time I needed to do something to alleviate the stress that was going on in the line around us because Mason was so hungry and he kept saying, ugh. This is taking forever, forever. We're never going to get up there to see this silly old thing. And what's the point of it anyways? And why do I want to do this? It's just, it's been forever. And that Altoid is not even working, mom. And, and, you know, he just kept saying forever and forever. Well, I was thinking about that word forever today. And, and, and it was such a, a negative memory in my mind. But then I read the scripture for today, boys and girls. And I want to draw you to the last verse. And um, we're going to read in a little bit from Psalm 111. And the last verse um, that we're going to read here says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding His praise endures forever. Well, this is the most beautiful forever. This is, I want us to think about forever when we think about the word in this verse. This forever means that God loves you forever. God's grace goes on forever. No matter what in the world we do, boys and girls, no matter how hangry we get, no matter what mistakes we make, no matter all of the things that we do in life that are not glorifying to God, God's love still is there for us forever. I I mean, that's the, the most beautiful thing. All we have to do is accept it and say, Lord, yes, be part of my life. And then we get this beautiful forever that's never gonna end. Love and grace and forgiveness and peace and kindness. And then we can take these things and share these with others. Um, And I want you to think about forever in this way. When you're frustrated and when things aren't going your way and you're thinking, ah, this is taking forever. I want you to remember that God is with you and God loves you forever, no matter what's happening. And I want to share the end of this story. I promise you, we made it to the top of the needle and there's Mason looking through the viewfinder. And you know what? When we got up there, 
He could see all of God's goodness and the beauty that went on below us, and he forgot all about being hungry and how excited he was to be at the top of this needle and see the beauty beneath him. Boys and girls, I hope that you have uh, the very best week, and I hope that you know how much we love you and that we pray for you. Would you bow your heads with me? God, we thank you so much for loving us forever and ever and ever. Thank you for walking beside us each day and helping us to feel your presence and your love. Be with these families as they go about their daily routines. Help them to remember what's most important, and that's all that comes from you. It is in your most holy name that we pray. Amen.
Let's pray together. Despite the beauty of the organ, despite the rhythm and harmony of the piano, despite the force behind our voice in singing how great you are, O God, there are parts of our souls and parts of our worlds that feel lack. I feel hurt, I feel doubt, I feel lost. We pray and we sing together to be reminded how great Thou art. Despite our fears, despite our anxieties, in the face of great trouble, remind us that Thou art greater. Thou art greater always, always, always. In the name of the Creator and the Christ and the Holy Spirit, we pray together. Amen. I invite you to receive these scriptures through the practice of Licto Divine, or Divine Word. I will read Psalm 111 with three small pauses following um, to allow ourselves and our minds to receive the Word and the Spirit of God. Today's reading from Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in in them. Full of honor and majesty in his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has gained renown by his wonderful deeds. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him, and he is ever mindful of his covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who practice it have good understanding. His praise endures forever. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Brothers and uh, sisters and friends, thank you for joining us again uh, for worship, wherever and however 
that you may be. I hope maybe you received word through our congregation that we intend to, to re return to worship in person for our 1045 a.m. service uh, beginning Lent, February the 21st. I'm grateful for our, our vision and leadership team who have led us in this way. Uh, grateful for uh, our team here who have um, been as flexible as possible for as long as possible. If there was an exact right perfect solution, we would have done one. Uh, churches don't often do bad things. Churches often do things badly. It's not often, it's not what we do, it's how we do it. And I will say uh, to you, my friends, uh, Second Baptist, uh, thank you. You have been so gracious uh, through this time and we continue to have hope and to uh, pray for healing for our world. Thank you. Our daughter, Eva, Spends a good bit of time practicing her A, B, C, uh, Ds. In Virginia, they only get to letter D by like the fourth grade. So I feel like we're already ahead uh, moving here. She spends a lot of time practicing her A, B, Cs and a lot of time practicing her one, two, three, fours. Sometimes there's a seven, eight, niner. I'm like, niner? Are, are you calling from a, are, are you practicing on a walkie-talkie? Niner, yeah. And every now and then, every now and then, she'll get as high as 14. Yeah, but 14 at our home is a real booger, okay? So it goes a little bit like this. Uh, 11, 12, stay with me, <laughs> 13, 14, 14, 14, 14. Those teens are really uh, killing us um, 14, 14 is everywhere in our home. Eva, how many goldfish do you want? 14. Okay. Eva, how old are you? 14. No, you're not. Eva, what time is it? It's 14. Eva, how many shares of GameStop did you buy this week? 14. Yeah, yeah. It reminds me, it reminds me a little bit of the story of um, the young girl, I, I imagine about Eva's age, who was in her room. And, and her grandfather in, in a room uh, over could hear his granddaughter saying her ABCs, A, B, C. Sometimes the letters would be just right in the right order, and other times the letters might come in a new interpretive uh, order, Q, T, V, 7. And the grandfather walked in and said, uh, Baby, honey, w what are you doing? Uh, and the young girl told her grandfather, I'm praying. The grandfather said, you're praying. It sounded like to me like you were practicing your ABCs. I thought I might come in here and help you. And she said, no, 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 I'm praying. I, I, just, say the, I just say the letters. And I have such hope that, that God will put the letters into words and that God will put the words into the right order. And today I'd like to spend a considerable amount of time thinking with you about a helpful order of letters. I'd like to spend with you some time thinking about a proper priority of numbers, which comes first and which comes next. And yet I am reminded, it seems, whether it is a sermon or a soliloquy, it seems that as though all speech... All spiritual speech in reality is probably just someone saying letters, hoping that God might put them into words, hoping that God might put those words into the right order, including the letters that you will soon, that you will soon hear. Psalm 111 begins with, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. First things first. The psalm begins with gratitude. And spirituality, I think you know this. I think in the heart of your hearts, you know this. That spirituality begins with gratitude. Spirituality, just a, a sort of a theological, philosophical word for that which truly matters most. It all begins with with gratitude, doesn't it? And you see, you might even say that all of Psalm 11 really isn't about thanksgiving or, or gratitude. However, it must begin here. It must set the table with thanksgiving because it can't really say anything else unless it has a foundation in gratitude. And might this be true for our lives as well? 
that we might not be able to offer, we might not be able to say anything with our lives until we first begin in gratitude. All of spirituality, it seems to me, might begin, you know this, it might begin with gratitude. After such a beginning, a psalm continues. In verse 2, Great are the works of the Lord. This proclamation of what God has done. Then the second part of verse 2. His words are to be studied and delighted in by all. First is a recognition and an appreciation. A praise even of what God has done. First is what God has done. Then next is the words about what God has has done. This refrain, this cycle, this call and response continues verses 2 through 9. Verse 3, honor and majesty are the works of God. Verse 4, wonderful are the deeds of God. Verse 5, the Lord provides food. Yeah. Verse 7, the works of God's hands are faithful and just. Then at the end of verse 7, do we read that the words about God are trustworthy? Yeah. It continues. Verse 8, God sends redemption to the people. And this is the action, the action, action, action. We want action. The action of God comes first. Then the second part of verse 8, His commands are established forever. Yeah. First is the word. Sorry. First is the work of God. Then it is the word. Then it is the word. And I'm not, this morning, I'm not trying to be down on scripture. Rather, I'm trying to be up on proper order. Yeah, proper priority. What is the Bible? What is the Bible? And this question our tradition have been asking for thousands of years. And let's be honest, we many of us even have been a part of communities that have argued and even divided over this question. What is the Bible? I probably have my first degree is entirely uh, based upon this question. What is the Bible? But now I find myself captivated by another question, which might also be a summary for the Christian faith, which might also be a summary of spiritual health. It's not necessarily answering the questions, but learning to ask better questions. What is the Bible was that question of the first half. Now I find myself asking the question, what is the Bible for? What are the scriptures for? And to be honest, here I am. I'm, I'm showing my, my cards. I'm, I'm showing my hand in, in, in that I prefer, I, I have this bend towards existentialism as opposed to empiricism. I, I, I find the functional to be more important than empiricism, which has this emphasis on proof. What is the Bible seems to be, at least to me, to be concerned with proof. What proof do you have for what is the Bible? Yet, what is the Bible for? What is the Bible for seems to be concerned with not proof, but pudding. (laughs) Yeah, the proof is in the pudding. Taste and see that the Lord is good. The pudding is delicious. And you know this. You know this in your lives and in your relationships. If that one that you desire, if that one that you desire says, I love you, but does not live it, you know that, that what that one truly believes. Yet if that one whom you desire acts in love to you, then when it is said, it makes it all the more true. Yeah. The work 
of God is displayed in all of creation, just as we have read. Great are the works of God, honor and majesty, wonderful deeds, merciful, feeding the people, sending redemption, full of justice, the works of God, then the word of God. Yeah. You see, I probably prefer, and my expertise bends towards recipes that say, chop it all up, throw it in a pot, turn it on for an hour or four. <laughs> That's about the, the max as to my culinary expertise. On occasion, on occasion, on a Saturday morning, I might try my hand at a pancake and brothers, sisters, friends, it is not a pretty. However, I have seen the master at work in the kitchen. Yeah. And I can testify <laughs> to such artistry. Yeah. Um, flour, salt, water, yeast. These are the four um, basic fundamental ingredients for all, for all breads. And it's not just the ingredients that matter. Specifically with baking, specifically with bread, the order matters. The order in which this is done matters. And I, I, I know uh, from messing it up all two times, messing up my pancakes um, uh, all, all too much, yet my family is so gracious and sometimes they eat it. If you put Nutella or chocolate chips on it, it, it goes down uh, better, right? But when the order is not followed, what tends to happen is the batter gets clumpy, yeah? And when the batter gets clumpy, you, you mix it harder and longer to try to work out the clumps. And there is such a thing as batter that has been over-mixed. Did you know? And when over-mixed batter is baked, the bread comes out hard. Yeah. And when we put the Bible before the works of God, we too, we are clumpy and we are rigid. Yeah. But when the works of God are first, and when that which can be said about God is second, then, then are you with me? There is this protective and golden crust and there is a delicious soul. You just fold it in. <laughs> you just fold it in. And the order of these things matter. I have not yet publicly or pastorally spoken about the events of January 6, 2021 in our nation's capital. And I cannot hear nor ever speak comprehensively uh, to such a matter. I will say that I agree with Christians, conservative, evangelical, liberal, and the alike who have labeled such events as domestic uh, terrorism. And I ask for your grace, certainly because there are a number of buzzwords that may be twisted in any number of directions. Uh, political theory is not my specialty, but pastoral theology is. And there was something that I saw on those videos from January 6th, something that troubled me deeply. Among many things, I saw flags, white flags. And in the corner of these white flags is a blue rectangle. And on that blue rectangle is a red cross. And I saw these flags trampling over public servants who have committed to serve and protect. And I saw this white flag on the House of the Representatives on the floor right there in our nation's capital. And... This is not, this is illustrative. This is not exhaustive as to that which can and needs to be said. But this is illustrative of the, uh, of one observation I have regarding that day. And this is that, that to carry such a symbol, bearing the cross, is a gross and awful misrepresentation of priorities. It's a 
The cross of Christ is a symbol of love, is a symbol of, of forgiveness. The cross of Christ is actually a symbol of the myth of violence. And if we are to be called by Christ, if we are to follow, if we are to become the people who God designs and desires for us to be, then you, Jesus says, then you, your politics, your preferences, you must learn to lay your life down. You must learn to not be first. You, as Christ did, must empty yourself. And as Christ does alongside with us, we condemn violence, particularly violence that uses a flag symbolizing the love and the hope of Christ to trample over others. And we are an inclusive community. And what this means is that, that we hold space and room for others to have their political preferences, to have various opinions. And one of the ways that we do this together is by learning that in our lives, we're not first. We're not first. And the order matters. It does. In one of the most widely published, globally translated books, The Little Prince, published posthumously in 1943 by St. Anton de Guyenne. Last week I butchered Spanish. This week I'm butchering French. I apologize. And in this book, the, the visitor, the little prince, says to the narrator, he says, if you want to build a ship, don't send people into the forest to cut down trees and gather wood. Rather, teach them to love the vastness of the sea. He continues three times, if you want to build a ship, don't delegate all the steps and all the tasks to your crew, but rather teach them to fall into the love of the immensity of the sea. If you want to build a ship, don't gather all that you need, but rather teach your crew to fall into love with the sea. John Mark McMillan says, the grace of God is an ocean and we are all sinking for God loves us. Yeah. God's works are mighty in majesty. They are wonderful and gracious and merciful. His hands are faithful. The Lord provides food, sends justice and redemption. When we fall in love with the gracious, incredible activity of God who saves, of God who is here, of God who cares, of God who takes on flesh, when, when this is center and first, First, all the other steps fall into place. It is God. It is God's breath that can fill our sails. It is, it is God's person who can anchor our lives before and above all else. And why, why wouldn't you write about it? Of course, when you have seen what God has done in history, when you have heard of what God has done in our world, when you take note even now what God is doing this very hour in your life, of course you would write about it. Of course you would sing about it. Of course you would paint about it. Yeah, God's work then. And when we have this priority held in proper humility, then we can begin to answer that question, what is the Bible for? What is it for? And Dr. Pete Inns, who we've spoke of uh, together before in his new book, How the Bible Actually Works, he says the Bible is not for uh, answers to all of life's mysteries. He said the Bible is not ammunition for all of life's arguments. Rather, the Bible is for wisdom. Yeah, it's for wisdom. 
And all of our Hebrew scriptures try to describe the wisdom of God. And it is in the New Testament that we see that God has taken on the form of flesh and in complete wisdom, Christ calls us to follow in that wisdom. Yeah, wisdom. Our psalm this morning begins in gratitude. Verse 1, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. And in verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fear here, not, not a word to scare. Fear here is a word of awe, a word of respect, a word of acknowledgement regarding all that God has done. The psalm begins in gratitude and ends in wisdom and is held together by awe because of what God has done. Yeah. Gratitude, awe, wisdom. Gratitude, awe, wisdom. A, B, C. One, two, three. Gratitude, awe, wisdom. A, B, F, C, seven, Q, fourteen, fourteen, fourteen. May God take these letters and these numbers and write grace upon our hearts. Amen. Friends, would you pray with me now? God, you are an awesome God. We give you all praise and honor today. You've been so generous with your love and your gifts, even when we don't deserve it. Lord, take these gifts, our gifts and talents that are given today, and bless them and multiply them to do your work in this community and throughout our city. Help us to share your love and be more like you. For you are great and gracious, and we love you so much. And it's in your most holy name that we pray. Amen.
as you well know, it is that by the goodness of God by which we have entered into this world and into this story. And it is the grace of God that has kept us all the days, even until this very moment. And it is the love of God fully revealed in the wisdom whom we call Christ. It is by that love by which you, my friends, my brothers and sisters, you are being redeemed. Go in the name of that love. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.